Do you agree that, you know, it's time that we all wake up and take responsibility, even for our ancestors that did not know any better? I've been waiting patiently to have this kind of conversation. <laughs> Welp, it's Wake Up With KC, I'm Kimberly, and today, you know, I come across fascinating people, and there's one in particular that I consider a multifaceted artist, and to me, he's like a legend, and I've watched him on TV shows, in movies, and I have the pleasure of having him as one of the guests on our show. Please welcome Larry Hankin. Larry, it's a pleasure to be here with you on Wake Up With KC. Well, it's a pleasure for me to be here with you on Kimberly <laughs> Chapman's welcome. What, what is it? KC. Good yes. morning, KC. Okay, cool, KC. Not like KC and the Sunshine Band, but yes, KC. <laughs> I find your career very fascinating, Larry, because you're not only a writer, performer, director, producer, you're also an Oscar nominee, but you're also a singer too. And no, no, that's the only one I'm not yet. I'm working on that one. <laughs> well, I was curious of hearing that that voice of yours. Um, but I mean, from starting out with the the one that I do know is How Sweet It Is with Debbie Reynolds and James wow. Gardner. You know, that James Gardner, come on. Um Working with them, that must have been, you know, an interesting experience. And then Escape from Alcatraz with Clint Eastwood. That was interesting. It, I bet. And then, you know, you go from like a serious to almost comical because then she's having a baby. Then you were Billy Madison with Adam Sandler and Breaking Bad, and the one that I find fascinating and most comical was Home Alone. You played the, the Sergeant Balzac. Sergeant Balzac. And, but the thing about it is, is you're on the phone and you're supposed to be talking to the mother and you're eating a donut and it falls on the mouthpiece. Was that intentional? Well, everybody asks me that. That's the most common question I've ever been asked. And uh, I don't know how I'll answer that. Well, okay. No, it, it, it wasn't in, intentional, but it took 12 takes for an accident to happen that was capturing lightning in a bottle. Um, I wanted to do it over because I thought I screwed up. Uh, and he goes, no, that's going in the movie. Are you kidding? Uh, <laughs> so that was a mistake that, that happened after... Um, there were, they thought there was a curse on the movie. I mean, I, I'm being, being serious now. Uh, I was hired be, because there was a curse on the movie. I was hired specifically. I wasn't in the movie. I wasn't supposed to be. I was not, what, wasn't cast in the movie. The movie started without me. And uh, I, I, what happened was Daniel Stern uh, who played opposite uh, Joe Pesci. He was the two bad guys, one of the two bad mm -hmm. guys. Daniel Stern um, wanted to quit after they after they shot for a week. He wanted more money. And he said, uh, he thought he had them over a barrel. They, you know, we shot a week. They, they've already got him, you know, so they can't fire him. So he asked for more money. He thought he's being cute. Uh, you got to be a lot cuter than that to get ahead of the producers of anything in this town. So uh, that's really, uh, okay, anyway, they, but they're serious about money. Uh, so he wanted to quit. So I got a phone call because I had worked for John Hughes, who wrote uh, Home Alone. Uh, they called, the producers called John uh, Hughes because he was also the producer, the writer-producer with, with these producers. And they said, look, Daniel Stearns wants to quit. He wants more money. What should we do, do John? And John said, Tell him to go F himself and get Larry Hankin to replace him. Just tell him to get out of there. Don't, don't bother with him. 
because I had worked two other movies with John Hughes, so he knew my work, and he, he just said, well, he could fill in. So they called me, and they said, um, if we do hire you, if Daniel quits or we fire him, and they were on the phone in another room with them. So they were talking, and this is down to it. In another hour, we're going to give him another hour, and whatever happens and we, we get rid of him, you're up, but you got to show up tomorrow morning because you're going to shoot tomorrow because we got to start all over and we don't have time to wait. We got to start sh reshooting now. Mm -hmm. So can you do that? And I said, yeah. And they said, okay, so hang by the phone, pack your bags. You'll have to catch a plane tonight to fly from LA to Chicago. Uh, so I did. And they said, wait there for an hour and we'll call you right back. And they called back and they said, uh, forget it. He he caved. He's still in the movie. He didn't get what he wanted. So we're continuing. I said, okay, fine. I mean, this is movies. This is how it's done. Right. You no, know, you, you don't take it personal. You just move on. You know, there there's other jobs. Hopefully. So uh, that's what I did. I forgot about it. And about two weeks later, I get another call, and they say, listen. Um, Listen, this is really, really bad. We're very sorry. And these are the producers who are talking to me. They said, we're very sorry. We apologize for, you know, jerking you around like that, saying you're going to be up for this part with Joe Pesci. And then we just, you know, canned you. And uh, now the movie is in trouble. This is what they told me. They said, we think the movie is cursed. We're having a lot of problems on this movie. And one of the reasons we think is because of what we – did to you. We jerked you around with hey, promising a job that you never got for a lot of big money. And uh, to make amends, we have to put you in the movie. In other words, this, this is the only thing we can think of to stop all these accidents that are happening. I mean, it's just way out of proportion. So will you, uh, he said, but here's the problem. We've cast the entire movie. We, we've started, we're shooting it. So there are no parts. We'd have to fire somebody to put you on. We can't do that because of contractual agreements. So there's only one part left, a very tiny, small part. It's only two lines. Now we, so we want you in the movie and we, it, because the movie is cursed, we have to have you in the movie. So we're willing to negotiate with you on these two lines because it's such a disrespect to you to give you only two lines when you're up for, you know, part of the lead in this movie. We're going to fly you first class there and back. We'll pick you up in a limo there and back. We'll deliver you, pick you up. We'll fly you out tomorrow morning. We'll shoot you as soon as you get here. We'll stop production and just shoot you. So if you show up at 10 o'clock, you will be filming by 1030. Uh, and it's a very small scene with Sergeant Balzac. It's two lines. And then you shoot the scene. Uh, we'll pay you. We'll fly you back first class and you can sleep in your own bed the same night. And for that, if we do that for us, because it's such an insult for such a small movie, we'll pay you $10,000. Please, will you do this? And I said, you bet I will. Are you kidding? <laughs> of course. Uh, so that's what they did, and that's why I was there. And sure enough, a white limo picked me up in the morning. I live in an apartment house. Everybody's going, whoa, who lives here that gets in a you know, white limo? They drove me there. They flew me first class. They picked me up in a white limo. They took me there. My costume was ready. Oh, and here's the kicker, why I'm telling you this story and why you ask. They said on the phone, they said, you know, so we'll pay you $10,000. And I said, yeah, great. Okay, let's do this. And they said, okay, so you only have one costume. It's our police costume. We'll have that. We, we got your sizes from John Hughes. We, we know your sizes. Uh, but, um, oh, yeah, uh, you can pick any prop you want. You know, we'll give you that, okay? You know, if you want a prop, anything, what do you want to work with? And I said, uh, give me a glazed donut, one glazed donut. And they said, that's it? That's what you want? And I said, yeah, it's a cop, you know. Give me a glazed donut, and I'm happy. 
Street, all right, fine, Larry. But boom, you know, white limo, first class, boom, let they land, get in my costume, it's in your dressing room. And they were all set up for, for me to show up. It was amazing, man. The 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 logistics. So uh I go in, I get my cop uh, costume on, I come out, and right next to the camera, you know, a baker, a baker's uh, rolling tray, you know, it's on rollers and it's got these tiers. And you put all the bread in it, you know, it's mm -hmm. about 100 loaves of bread on it. Well, right next to the camera, they had a rolling baker's tray with 250 glazed donuts on it. And I go, what's this? They said, well, you asked for glazed donut. I said, yeah, I asked for one glazed donut. He says, well, maybe you'll have to do two takes, you know, insurance. So I thought that was funny. They all laughed. We all laughed. But I did one take. I, you know, I ate the donut. But. In the middle of the take, or right near the end of the take, the camera shook. So if you notice, it's only one. It's it's one shot. You know, it's a it's a moving shot. It goes from me, and then it just moves on. So so if any shake anywhere in between, you have to do the whole thing over again. One shake, boom. Okay, so we do second take. Uh, the camera was out of register or something. In one take, the lights above these big, huge, uh, you know, uh, Klieg lights, movie lights. It, it burst, blew up, and it rained all, you know, shattered glass. So Lova said they had to clean up. So we had to shoot this thing 10 times. And 10 times there was a technical glitch. And around the eighth time, you just see this pall on everybody's face like, oh, my God, the movie is cursed. I start to see what they were talking about. I go, holy cow, they weren't making this up. I start to think, yeah, it is cursed. We can't get through this one little two-line take. We couldn't do it. So on the 11th take, you know, I'm eating my 11th donut. Thank God they had 250 donuts. On the 11th take, I'm eating the donut, and I'm waiting. You know, now I'm, I'm conditioned to they're going to cut because something went wrong. And I'm, I'm eating the donut, and nothing. And all it goes long. Rose, you know, hyper on two, and the director yells, cut, which I haven't heard in the 11 times. This is the first time I've heard cut. We've got all the way through, and nothing happened. And then as soon as the director yelled cut, everybody on the set, and there was about 100 people. It was a very expensive movie. Everybody broke down laughing. They were holding it in until the director yelled cut. And I, oh, and I go, oh, man, now what? Now what? That's what I thought. You know, something happened that was funny, but we're going to have to shoot it again. So you know, Christopher Columbus goes running over to me, says, come here, come here. I got to show you something. I said, no, let's just do it again. That's just the screw up, right? He says, no, no, no. Come here. You got to see it. You got to see this. So he dragged me. I said, no, no. It's me. And then I thought, that's what I thought. It's me. I screwed up. That's what they were laughing at. And I said to Christopher, I said, look, it's me. If I screwed up, I don't want to watch me screw up. Let's just do it again. And he says, no, watch this. And he turns it on. And I'm watching and nothing's happening. It's just a scene, blah, 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 blah. And there's one piece of donut. <laughs> and it sticks. And I go, and I laugh. And I go, oh, my God. Oh, man, we have to do it again. That's a, a fuck up. And he goes, no, 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 this is in the movie. This is in the movie. You get out of here. You can go home. So I got in the white limos and I flew home. That's, that's Did you realize the donut was on there or no? No, I had no idea. I'm, I'm you know, doing work and the, 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 the thing was down here. So no, I had no idea. And I'm talking and I'm talking. And it just stuck there. And everybody on the set, you know, they told me later. <laughs> Until they got cut and it, <laughs> and so when I but when I saw it, I thought I, it was me. It was my fault. Oh, I screwed up. I screwed up the donut. No, no, this is going in the movie, and everybody wants to know. You know, all all the fans. Going, no, was that an uh, 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 what is this uh, 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 CGI oh, or something, or you know, the green screen or what? Oh yeah, they, they thought it was you know all set up. How did you do that? You know. Was it an insert? No, it's a screw up, you know. <laughs> that that piece of donut is more famous than I am. <laughs> Everybody <laughs> loves that piece of donut. Oh, hey, yeah, tell us about the donut. Yeah. <laughs> well, 
and movies. movies and whatnot, you know, you got those movie critics that there are mistakes that people don't sure. recognize. So we just think, oh, that must have been one of those. But you when, when, you really, when you really look at it, I question, like, was that intentional? Because it, it's perfect because of the way the movie is all about. It's a comical. But I didn't realize that, you know, everyone started thinking it was cursed. Because I'm looking at all the incidents throughout the movie of the. Oh, 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 oh I see. I see. Yeah, yeah. So uh, that's well, yeah, well, that's that, that's probably why it works so well, because I've, I've watched the movie with an audience and it's a it's a big laugh. It, it, it was hysterical. Oh, my God. And, and because of that, this character, Sergeant Balzac, uh, first of all, is a funny name. Uh, Balzac. Uh, if, you, if you, you know jiggle it a little and, and the second thing is um that because of the donut falling on on it and what you said you know the setup of the rest of the movie sergeant balzac has two lines and he's as famous as the other three stars of the movie they're, 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 it's you know pesci daniel and the kid and sergeant balzac <laughs> Of the three stars of the movie. It's just really weird. I had nothing to do with it, man. I wasn't even in the movie. They called me, you know, out of the blue. So it's just, you know, movies is magic. That's the name of my a friend of mine's production company, Movies is Magic Productions. And I see why. You know, yes. And then not only have you been in movies, but you've been on some TV uh, series like oh, yeah. so, um, sitcoms and stuff, and being Tom Pepper. Now, you auditioned for that like five, five times. times. Five times, and I was really PO'd. You <laughs> share with us about because that. A, they're supposed to pay you to audition after three. If you audition three times, they still haven't made up their mind. They have to pay you, and they never paid me. And I that always was in the back of my mind. I never said anything because I wanted the role. I didn't want to, you know, make any waves. And I guess that's why they knew they didn't have to pay me, you know, because Seinfeld was such a big hit at the time that they figured, well, you don't have to pay him. He's not going to say anything. We, you know, we don't have to hire him. I mean, yeah, I was really PO'd the whole time. But, but, uh, um, Michael Michael Richards, we we were old friends for years before that. I mean, because we were always auditioning for the same thing. We were, uh, you know, tall, funny guys. So we were kind of the same auditioning for the same thing. We even played brothers on a, on a sitcom, uh, some some restaurant sitcom. I don't remember the name of it, but we played brothers, and we would argue because we're totally opposite in in humor in. in uh, senses of humor and our approach to humor. He goes over the top and I go underneath. So he goes over, I go under. And so we were playing brothers and we had to be in a, uh, we, we, we robbed a restaurant. That was the, it was a sitcom restaurant and one episode, two guys come in and rob the place. That was us. But there's a scene where we're escaping in a truck. So we had a scene just between us two in a truck. That was a CGI with a you know a green screen behind us. Mm -hmm. We just in the cab. So we were so we were rehearsing off off set somewhere else, not on the set where you have all the cameras. We were just somewhere else. So while they were shooting that, we were rehearsing, and the argument was the most ridiculous argument I've ever been in my life. And I wanted to record it, but there was no way because we were arguing on how to get the, the laugh that was on the page. And he wanted to go over the top and I wanted to go under. And so we were arguing about, you know, what's funny. <laughs> and two comedians arguing about what's funny and how to be funny with what's written on the page it was just bizarre and ridiculous. But we were serious. We were into it. No, no, you got to say this, and then I do that. No, and then no, no, you got. Yeah. But but anyway, when we it was our turn to shoot it, uh, the director says, "Okay, you know, just run it so we could watch it." And we were arguing, you know, and kind of a you know, we were jockeying for how to 
do it and get my way. And, but, you know, but the upshot of that is that it's not funny at all because it's just two people doing different things. It's not working. Right. So we just said, what's going on? And then we told him, well, we, I want to do it. Through. He said, let's just do it a third way. Okay. Just do it as written my way. So that, that's what we did. So it was, you know, it's kind of kind of funny. So no, neither of us was satisfied. It was, he he did the middle thing, you know. uh, but but we knew each other. So when we I did that Tom Pepper. He was the one who suggested me, as a matter of fact, Michael Richards oh, wow. suggested to get me to play Kramer, uh, and Larry David wanted me to because he had seen my other work, and I was the the closest to what Larry uh, to what. Um, Kramer was. There's a real guy named Kramer. Uh, and they were doing him in the show. And I, I really kind of look like Kramer's brother. Uh, I, you know, I've seen him. I haven't met him, but I've seen him. Uh, so I look like, but but no, when I saw the show and I knew I was up against, uh, who was that? Oh, I auditioned for Michael Richards' part for Kramer, but then I had to audition to get the imitating uh, Tom Pepper. So in both instances, Michael wanted me to, well, he, he wanted the role, but he wanted me to play him. That was, that was what, uh, but, but uh, I wanted the role, but Michael Rich has got it. And then uh, when I saw who got the role, cause I wanted to see, you know, I was, because there's nobody else who looked like, uh, like, uh, well, no, no, that was the, see, I get them mixed up between auditioning for Kramer and auditioning for Tom Pepper. Right. They were like months apart. Uh, so let me, let me straighten this out. I was auditioning against Michael Richards for the part and he got it. So that was okay. You audition, you don't get it, you move on. I watched the show to see who got it, just to see. And I liked what Michael Richards was doing, so I thought they picked the right guy. I mean, he was going over the top, coming in the door and stuff. I would never have come up with that. I would have gone this. So I, you know, I appreciate good work, and Michael was doing great work. You know, you can't yes. argue with that. But doing the audition that Michael suggested me for to imitate him, that I had a problem with because nobody looked like Michael Richards. Everybody who was auditioning was either fat, short, skinny, had a beard. Um, nothing. I was the only guy. So I thought, I'm a shoe in. I, I got this. I mean, we, we played brothers. And each time I auditioned five times for, for Pepper. And each time I went in, it was the same people. You know, fat guy, short guy, a bearded guy. And I'm going, what? what's going on? They're not paying me. And I'm auditioning against people who have no way they look like Kramer. So I was getting bugged, I, you know. So on the on the fifth time, I was going to tell them off. If, if they told me to come in the door once more, each time I had an audition, one of the audition things was, oh, man, I'm just going to shut this off. Um, okay, I got one <laughs> Jesus Christ. Uh-oh. What happened? What? Oh, okay. There you go. Yeah, I'm here. <laughs> yeah, I, I know. Uh, so uh, I wanted to, I, I, I auditioned five times and each time the same people. So on the fifth time, I thought if they do anything untoward or tell me to do anything I don't want to do, I'm going to unload on them. In other words, all this anger of five times was going to just come right. out. And there was one guy who I didn't know in the room. I knew there was... Uh, 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 well, who's a star? Uh, the, the, the Seinfeld. Seinfeld. There, was, there was Seinfeld, there was Costanza, there was a director. You can always tell a director in an in audition. He's the, he's the one who's the sloppiest dressed. He's the one who looks homeless. That's the director. And then there was a guy in a suit. And he knew, oh, that's a producer. And then there was another bald guy, and I don't know who the hell he was. Jason. Um... No, no, that was Costanza. Uh -oh. uh, 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 so there was a, guy, a third guy, there was a, I don't know, fourth, fifth guy. I didn't know who he was, but he didn't say anything. He just sat there and watched the whole time. Never said anything except at the end when everybody said, anybody got anything else to ask or, you know, have Larry do? And he would always pipe up the last guy for the, 
every in the five times you go, uh, yeah, I I would do, La, uh, Larry, would you come in the door like Kramer? And now at the, the first time or the second time I had to do that. Um, I understood that, okay, if you're going to imitate Kramer. That's one of the things you have to imitate. So that was a perfectly logical thing for somebody to ask me to do. So I'd go out. Now, when I went out the door, I went out into the waiting room that, you know, and there was everybody, you know, the other fat guy, the short guy. Uh, and I didn't see when everybody else went into audition, I didn't see them come out and go in. So I was wondering about that. And then the third time I audition, same thing, go out. And I'm going, who is this guy? And why is he asking me to come in? You know, he saw me twice. Fourth time, he go out and come in. I go, what the hell is going on? They're not even paying me. I didn't see anybody else doing this. What? You know, but if, so on the fifth time, I was going to unload on this guy. I mean, just, I didn't care. I, I didn't want the job anymore. I didn't think it was worth it. You know, sometimes you just get insulted. Oh, I do. I just get insulted and I don't care. And that's my go-to. I, I don't care. I'm a stand-up comedian. I don't need this or you. I just get an attitude. So, But luckily, when I went out, not only is a waiting room, there's a, um, a secretary there, receptionist. So when I went out and I closed the door, I just quickly whispered to her. I said, hey. Who is that bald guy in there with the glasses who keeps on telling me to come out and go in like Kramer? Who is that? And she says, oh, that's Larry David. He owns the show and he writes it. And I go, oh. So when I went back in, I said, oh, yeah, I just, oh, cool, man. I love the show. You own it. Fine. You want me to do it five times? I'll do it five times. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, I'm not stupid. <laughs> oh, I, I got I got a quick temper, but I'm not stupid. <laughs> so, well, speaking of uh, com, you know, being a comic comedian, stand up, you, that's how how you started out. And I, I never wanted to be a, uh, an actor. I, I still don't want to be an actor. I don't know how to act. I pretend. <laughs> I think everybody knows how to act. They just don't know they're doing it. I don't know how to act. I don't. I, yeah. I, I just, you know, I, 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 I improv. I, you know, I studied with Viola Spolin. That's like the Lee Strasberg of improv. You know, I studied with her. I know how to improvise. There's, there's rules, like, like acting rules, like painting rules, like, you know, architecture rules. There's rules where you, even if you screw up, the audience never knows, you know, because it's, quote, improv. But uh, so that that didn't bother me. Uh, but I'm a stand-up comedian. I, I don't know the rules of acting. I don't know how to memorize. I can't memorize. Uh, I, I mean, I, I can memorize up to a point, and then I can't. I'm not an actor. You know, like, you know, uh, yeah, I'll give you an example of, you know, uh, have you seen Mr. and Mrs. Smith, you know, with. Uh, yeah. Uh, okay. In that, that movie, <laughs> I use this as an example of why I can't, I'm not an actor. In Mr. and Mrs. Smith, uh, they, they're fighting. They, you know, they're, they're married or they're getting divorced, whatever. They're, but they're detectives and they got guns. Okay, so in this house, and they're fighting and they're shooting at one another and they're punching at one another uh, and they're talking to one another and, uh, and they're, they're doing this scene and it's a long scene. Okay, that to me is acting. I can't do that. I can't fight and shoot and talk at the same time. I mean, I just can't do that, man. My mind cannot keep track of all, all the different fingers and hands and talks and tongues and, and things. I just can't do it. So I'm not an actor. So I, Or if you give me a long speech, I can't do it. Uh, when I did Breaking Bad, they gave me a long speech when I showed up. I only had five lines in that my, the first time I did Breaking Bad. But when I showed up, there was a, a long speech. And I said, what is this? Because I knew it. Right. So the AD said, um, oh, Vince Gilligan liked your audition tape so much that he had one of the writers write you a monologue. And I'm going, no, I can't, I'm dyslexic. No, I can't do this. And he started to get, 
because I started to freak out. He just got out of there. He said, I got to get back to the set. I don't know about this. And he just split. I said, how long do I have? He says, two hours before you shoot. So so what I did was I made my part up. I, I couldn't memorize that, but I wouldn't cop to it. I, I didn't tell the director that, you know, I, 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 I can't memorize this. It's too short. I need a week and then I can do it, but not two hours. So I didn't say anything. I just showed up on the set. Now, I had done my five lines about three hours before that. So he had seen me act, quote, I did five lines, easy peasy. It was with Brian Cranston. I did it so well. If you, if you watch it, I thought I did it great. It was the best piece of acting I've ever done, but it was five lines and it was a master, Brian Cranston. But Brian Cranston even liked what I did. So I thought, I'm cool. And the director thought, well, I got an actor here. You know, this monologue is going to go sweet. <laughs> no. So um, I just didn't say anything. He said, uh, just get down there and walk to the camera. We're going to do it in one take. He's not even going to break it down so I can memorize as you know, as we go along. One take, okay, one shot, just a pave. And I and it was all legal. It was keeping the cop out of the Winnebago before I destroy it as old Joe in the, the junkyard. So they're hiding in there. So it's all legalese that the monologue was to keep the cop, you know, out of the Winnebago. So I just improvised legalese because, I, well, I studied with my old spell and I can handle this. I'm not going to tell him. I'll just make it up. Uh, so I, I do it. And all I could remember was don't stutter. Don't stop. Don't say, um, just keep talking. That's that was the only thing I had as a, as a guide. And I just said every piece of legalese that ever came to my mind from my from my entire life and the monologue. I was just speaking. And I, in the middle of it, you know, your mind can do two things. I was talking like crazy and I was thinking, holy cow, I'm, I'm doing this. I'm not stuttering. I'm not stopping. I'm just talking, man. It's just this flow, you know, rap, rap, man. I had flow. So I thought, I'm getting away with this. This is so cool. I remember in, in reading The Three Musketeers, there's one thing where a, a house is caving in and the strong uh, musketeer goes to save the weak musketeer. And he's running upstairs as his stone castle is caving in around him. And he's running up the stairs and he's carrying his buddy. And he's thinking, I'm taking these stairs three steps at a time and I'm not missing and I'm running fast. And the, and the writer, Dumas, writes, and he was thinking too much about his feet and not where he was going, and he trips, and both of them are killed. Okay. And that's what I was thinking. Don't even think about that, Larry. Just dude, don't think about anything. Just keep talking. I get to the end, and I think I'm going to get fired because the uh, – uh, I had heard that the, I wanted to talk to the, to the writer, you know, to, to make it shorter. So I said to the AD, where's the writer? I know there's always a writer on the set. Let me talk to the writer. Maybe I can convince him to get it down. And he said, the director wrote it. So the director knew exactly what I was doing. I was making his writing up, which is a total no-no. I mean, nobody does that ever. So I thought when I would get to the end, because I knew he wrote it, he knows I'm making this up. I thought uh, he's going to fire me because uh, the cat's out of the bag. And when I got to the end and he said, yelled cut, I was ready to hear, you know, okay, Larry, you're fired. He said, okay, that's great. Uh, let's just do it one more for insurance. And I was totally stunned. I mean, I didn't know what was going on. Do you mean to say, I said to myself, I memorized the whole thing without knowing it because he just said, let's do it again. You know, just one more. And then they had that. We were in the middle of the desert. This junkyard was in the middle of a, of a New Mexico desert. They already had, um, there was paths in this junkyard between these huge, it was a metal junkyard. So they had a limo pulled up right next to the camera. So when I finished my shot, I get in a limo and they drive me back to the production office. I was finished for the day. 
So the car was waiting there. And when he said, okay, let's just do one more just for insurance. You know, I thought I memorized it. Okay. And he says, so go back there and let's just do it once more. And he was totally calm, totally, you know, believable. And I walked back out there and I thought, oh my God, I don't have to um, even improvise. And I can make mistakes because he's got it in the can. I memorized it. That was amazing. So I just improvised it again, you know, and I was very relaxed, uh, you know, just trying to do the same thing, improvise it, think of all the legalese things. And then he said, yeah, I figured, well, okay, now he's going to say I'm fired. And he goes, no, okay, Larry's dismissed. You know, everybody, Larry's dismissed. They always clap whoever is dismissed, you know, extra or star. Okay. And I got in the limo and I, now I don't know what happened. So I had to wait two weeks to find out what the hell did I do that was so acceptable? I mean, because I knew I, I didn't, you know, I went back into when I, I had to get, uh, get, you know, get out of my costume. So they drove me to my dressing room. I looked at the words. They weren't my words. In other words, I didn't memorize it. I had made it up, you know. So when I watched it, here's movies is magic. That's where it comes in. Where I watched it, and if you watch it, I'm in the scene, me, Larry Hankin, being photographed on camera. Nine seconds. What the, the director did, and he knew the minute I started talking that this guy doesn't know what he's doing. But what he did was he made me do it again because I got enough legalese about not letting the cop into the Winnebago that he took the two improvisations and he edited it together so that it formed a voiceover. And then they just cut to the cop, to the Winnebago, to Aaron, to Brian, to the cop. Three seconds to me when I said something that was right or kind of like what should be said. And then they got away immediately three times. So each time, two seconds and three seconds. So it was about, I timed it. I watched it a couple of times and I timed it with a stopwatch. Nine seconds. So movies is magic. Now, I've talked to a lot of, you know, um, uh, Breaking Bad buffs, you know, these young college kids, you know, who are, you know, mad about it. They know everything about it, you know. I they said, you know, what did you think about that scene? Oh, you are so cool, man. I said, yeah, but tell me what you saw. Well, you were walking and talking, man, and keeping the guy out of the thing. I go, no, that's not what's going on. What did you see? I saw you walking and talking, man. And then there was like, the cop and then there was Aaron and the, uh, Brian. No, I was in three seconds. And then they start to think, oh. And they went and watched it again because they're crazy. They they just, everything has to be known. So, yeah, I mean, that's why I'm not an actor. I, I'm, a, I'm an innocent bystander. And I'm writing a book about it. I mean, most I I don't know because I don't I don't follow me I don't follow actors I follow musicians I don't I just you know uh, but um, you know when I when I listen to podcasts about other actors they talk about acting and their character and the backstory and you know how they work it out and how they rehearse I I just tell what happened on the set because that's all that's all I do. It's, well, then, Larry, let me ask you something. It, you said you had um, d dyslexia and ADHD, correct? So becoming a stand-up comic, uh, comedian, no, and okay. then going into, you know, movies and, and TVs, how did you, like, what techniques or little tricks did you learn? Because... You love being able to, I guess, perform improv, so to speak. So what perform. I'm a performer. I'm a performer. Okay, performer. What techniques did you learn to help you get as far as you've come in the, in the industry that you could help somebody well, that struggles with the same? Somebody told me. I, I didn't come up with it. I never thought about it. I just did what I had to do to get the part. But somebody saw a, a lot enough of my roles to say, you know, Larry, uh, they gave me a hint. They said, you know, 
Larry, uh, they were talking about a uh, particular thing. Let, let's say Sergeant Balzac. They were talking okay. about Sergeant Balzac. And he said, my God, Larry, you know, uh, I watched with my little brother. The kids watch that movie and families watch that movie. But the kids are the ones who talk to me. And they said, I, wa I watched that kid with my, uh, I watched that movie with my kid brother. And the, and the character that he loved the most is Mr. Sergeant Balzac. Now, Sergeant Balzac is on maybe for about 20 seconds in that movie, 30 seconds. It's that, it's the pan. It's just, you know, hey, you know, you want me to uh, go to your house and check on your child? And then I go boom, 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 and then the camera starts to move and it slowly moves. Hey, Rose, hyper on two, and then it's on her. So I'm on screen for 30 seconds and, and children all over the world. Remember, Sergeant Balzac, because of that donut thing, is so funny. And he, Sergeant Balzac, is so funny looking, eating his donut and talking on the phone to a mother about watching a kid. It's a lot of kid stuff that unconsciously and subconsciously the writers put into that character. It's on the page. So, okay. What I'm saying is that all the children say, you're, you're funny. When you come on screen, I only watch you. Now, I have nothing to do with that. I never knew that until a kid told me that. So a kid pinned. And the other thing is, because I have dyslexia, I voluntarily only go up for roles or choose roles that I know I can memorize a priori in front. So I don't, if I turn down huge starring role, well, not starring roles, but Daniel jo Joe Pesci or Daniel Stern Joe Pesci roles because the part was too big for me to memorize in the time given. If you give me enough time, if I see, okay, and I, there's a, um, uh, uh, my, my agents at the time, uh, my, my, my acting agents uh, at the time knew to put that in the contract that Larry has to get the script before everybody else, uh, or, or at least the, one of the first ones to get the script because he has dyslexia and needs the time to memorize. So either I take a short part because I don't have time to mem memorize it, or I have enough time to memorize it so I can take a longer part. So that's the, quote, trick that you're looking for is I don't even go into it unless I know I can do it because I have dyslexia and ADHD. So luckily, the two combined. I take mainly and mostly, predominantly, short parts because of my dyslexia and, which is something I have nothing to do with, man. I never knew I had it. If I come on screen, the eye tends to go towards my character. I don't know why. I don't question it. It's cool. It helps. But I have no control over it. So that's the only two tricks I know. One I have nothing to do with. And the other one, it's way before I even get involved. That's my trick. Other than that, I sweat to get it memorized. <laughs> I like, you know, tell my friends. If I, I have a girlfriend, I tell her, look, you're not going to see me for three days. Well, you know why? Just something I said. No, I got to work on the fourth day, and I need three days to memorize, you know, this half a page. You know, he says, okay. And I do. I lock myself away, you know, and, and I just repeat and repeat and repeat until it gets it in. I mean, I did a play the last time I did a major role many, many years ago. I had to go out to the beach. I, I live near the beach. So I'd go out on a jetty with my book. And I would just scream it out at the ocean, you know, because I had these long speeches. It was a play. And I was young and bold. <laughs> so I would go out and you'd see this guy, this tall guy standing on the edge of a jetty in these waves. And, and I'm shouting at it. It's like Shakespearean. I'm shouting my line so that it, not, I'm not shouting at the ocean. I'm trying to get it down into, you know, loud, my ears. It was crazy. But I would do it every, you know, every morning and go out there. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, you think it's easy being an actor. That's why I'm not an actor. You know, 
uh, and that's why I'm a great improviser because you don't, there's, there are no lines, you just make it up. But the ADHD feeds them. That's, that's where ADHD comes into great play is, you know, ADHD is, man, you know, you can't concentrate on any one thing for too long. So you can be throwing shit at me and I can just juggle it because <laughs> I have ADHD. So I you know, have nothing to do with it. So I was a great improviser. I mean, they, they, they still talk about me in San Francisco. About, oh, I saw Larry Hankin. He was so funny. Yeah, because, you know. But I'm, I'm not an actor. Can okay. you share with us? I know there's a book that you wrote, um, The Loopholes Dossier, The Three Comics. Dossier, I think. It's French. I don't know. Loopholes Dossier, I say. I don't know. What about it? What inspired you to write the book? From an experience? Oh, well, but no, because I was improvising a lot of characters um, in my spare time. Uh, no, um, uh, I had these. Um, oh, okay. Um, uh, when I was improvising in, in the committee, and I was doing that every night, I mean, you know, I was there for 10 years. I, I was improvising for, a, for many years. Uh, my youth was spent improvising. I got really good at it. I mean, if you do anything for 10 years, you're going to get good at it. Even if you're awful. Uh, example, Vincent van Gogh. I mean, if you look at his early paintings, no way. And then, you know, about 15 years later, yeah, I, I once walked into a room of Vincent van Gogh paintings in a museum, and I was actually blown out of the room. I just, you know, came around the corner. And then, Whoa! My eyes, my eyes. <laughs> So, you know, I, I got really good at it. Uh, but um, I, okay, so what was, uh, 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 what was the question? The book, uh, what inspired you to write the loophole? Okay, so you? when I was improvising, that's all I did. And uh, we had a plenty of spare time because we didn't have to study anything. We just had to pay attention to what was going to the world. You know, watch television, read newspapers, get involved with your girlfriend, with people, with kids you know, do laundry, have a life. And then you get on the stage and you don't have to worry. You, you, you've got it. You've done your research. Uh, so um, what, what I would do is I'd have a lot of spare time. So I would write. And I would just put them in a drawer, uh, especially late at night. Uh, you know, uh, we had, a, you know, generally did two shows. So I was through work at, well, any kind of performer, not even a nightclub, stand-up comedian. You're doing two shows. I mean, you're finished at 12. You're hyper. You're you're up. You're, you've got all this energy from doing two shows. You know, you're like that. So I would write. I'd go home and I'd write. And I would put them in a drawer. And finally, uh, years, and yeah, I saved them. And no, no matter where I moved, I would carry this, this box of matchbook covers with notes on it, napkins with notes on it, pages notebooks and I would then move and then and one day I just had so many two or three boxes and I said I should put them make a book so that's what I did so I took all these and I had specifically after I was writing for a long time I started to become fluent in it I, I started to get flow in typing uh, and, and so I would type these short stories which were very funny they were uh, Kind of Aesop's fables brought up into modern, instead of uh, Aesop's or, or Aesop or animals, telling stories about animals, I would tell stories about a, a kid, a 15-year-old kid named Sometimes Jones, which was my childhood at 15, my fantasies of, of running away and having adventures. And so this kid had Aesopian adventures, you know, with a moral at the end, but they were funny morals and stuff like that. Um, so I collected them and I thought I'll make a book. And then I only had half a book I, I, of, 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 of these moral funny fables. And they were funny fables. That's what they were. So I had about 10, I think. And it was only about 150 pages. So I needed about 100 more pages. And I thought, well, let me try a long form writing. Now that I had my chops about writing, this was years later when I got to LA and I was an actor and I saw these boxes. So I hadn't written in a while and I thought, okay, I've been doing characters. Let me just 
make up a real character. Uh, his name was Barnum Just, uh, yeah, Barnum Justice, and uh, he was a homeless guy. Because I've been doing a lot of homeless guys on 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 screen, uh, and I and and voluntarily so. I know that I seek out homeless characters to audition for. Uh, I did one where I was God as a homeless guy. Um, uh, so. Um, I thought I, I'll, I'll develop a character, Barnum Jesse. He was a homeless guy. And then I said, okay, uh, I remember, have you ever lived in New York uh, at all or ever? No. I visited, but never. Okay. You visited, I, I guess, when I used to, I'm from New York and I lived in the village and stuff. Um, when I would walk down the street, there would be homeless people all over. Now there's homeless people all over everywhere. But they would all be writing in these books, these crackle Crackle-covered uh, notebooks for school, mm -hmm. writing in it, and and I always wondered what they were writing. You know, they was homeless. They were sitting on the ground in rags, and they were writing. And I would, you know, give them like a dollar or a quarter or whatever I had, some spare change, and I'd say, "Can I see what you're writing?" And none of them ever let me read anything in their book. No, no, and they would accept the money, but no. Or, you know, if I would say, well, I'm not going to give you the money, and they'd say, fuck you, you can't. No. I mean, that's how, even though they wanted the money, they, they wouldn't let me see it. So, you yeah. know, I would give them the money. I wouldn't walk away. Well, fuck you. you know, no, okay, you can't do that. Not, not be, and be an artist. No, you can't do that. <laughs> if you're greedy, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yay. So, anyway, um, I got the idea that the homeless guy, Barnum Justice, would be writing notebooks and I would write my own notebook. Barnum, I would finally read what was in these books because I would write the book. Barnum would write the book. So that's what I, I did. Barnum, these were notebooks. And then I made up a story to introduce Barnum to the reader saying, you know, my name is Larry Hankin. I'm a writer. And Barnum Justice is a homeless guy I would see all the time here in Venice. I mean, we're just covered with homeless. There's more homeless people than there are people living in houses right now. It's crazy. It really is. There's, I live on the bike path. I, I live near a bike path on the beach. And I, I go on a bike ride maybe every other morning for about two miles. Two miles of tents of homeless people. Two miles along the bike path on the beach. There's the beach, there's tents, and then there's the bike path. It's crazy, man. So I made the uh, uh, aesthetic jump that these were the uh, Barnum Justice died on the beach. He was found by two lifeguards, a heart attack. He was old. He was an old guy. And uh, his little tent uh, they confiscated all his stuff. He had a girlfriend, and uh, she took all his stuff, and he had 34 notebook pages, crackle, you know, bound notebook pages of notes he had made writing all his life. And he had, because I was his friend, uh, he had left me the top three, the last three, uh, books 34, 30, 35, 37, 38, and 39. Notebooks 37, 38, and 39 left me. And these were the 100 pages that I published. Oh, is, is oh, wow. the, so the, and the last book before he died. And they were, was what he would do, the, the, the trope of the character was, he had this. This is a little tape recorder, right? And he had this, and he carried this with him. And he would just always talk into it. Uh, he had these great, great thoughts or something, and he would tape it, and then he would go home and he would write it in the notebook. So these were the taped conversations he had. And he would be walking with you, you know, he'd be walking and talking with me, I'd say, and uh, he would just stop and he would turn and he would talk. And he never would, he wouldn't let you hear what he said, and he never played it for anybody. He never, you know, just like the guys wouldn't let you read the book. He wouldn't. Right. He wouldn't hear you, let you hear you. He would talk. And I always wondered in the book, you know, what he was saying. And finally, he had left me these three books. And what it is, is 
uh, the three last books were How to Be Homeless. That, that, that's what he wrote, How to Be Homeless. He was wow. teaching. He was teaching. He was running a little pod on the. Yeah, you, you, you would see it as you ride your bike. Was one ride your bike? You would see they have exercises. If you go early, early in the morning, eight o'clock in the morning, you would see these exercise people or these gurus with the, you know, uh, what do you call it? Um, <coughs> exercises and all kinds of things. Nam Yaho Ringe Kill. So he had a little class on how to be homeless. You know, like, you know, don't do this, do this. You can live here, you can't live there. Uh, how to get food, how to get spare change, how to beg for money. Just because I, I was homeless for a year. I lived in a car for a year, my own. I was homeless. Uh, yeah, wow. I so I knew how to be homeless. I mean, it's not easy. It's you don't want to be homeless. No. The whole point of being homeless is you either know how to be homeless and that's your glory. That you got it down. You see these guys walking around. They don't want to be other than homeless. They're rare, but they're out there. In other words, you you got to have a reason to live. You you or you commit suicide. And when you get that down, that low, you you need something to keep your ego going. And you go, okay, I got this. You guys don't know how to be homeless. You're scruffling, you're filthy, you're begging for money. But I take a bath every day. I wash my clothes. I beg for money and I'm homeless and I got this. And it keeps them alive, keeps them going. It's, it's, and you don't want to get there because you never leave. That's, that's the, uh, what do you call it? The long, long termers, <laughs> the long termers. That's wow. what, you know, but others, the 99.9% .9 of the homeless, they're not lazy. They, they are the, you know, fate and, and, you know, and greed put them there, either their own greed or somebody else's greed or, you know, or, or jealousy or whatever. In other words, it's, they're, they're tripping over their own dick is what I'm saying. You know, they just their own fault, you know, but they don't have the tools to get out. They want to get out, but they don't have the tools. But this guy, Barnum was bragging about, I have the tools. I have the tools wow. to get here. You know, and I'm going to teach you the tools. You can use them or not. You either use the tools or get out. And the faster you get out, the better it is. Because the longer you stay, the harder it is to get out. You know, Especially in these times, wouldn't you agree? I mean, and by the way, how's the weather over there on the West Coast? I'm sorry, I'm sorry say, that, say that again. How I said that is a like hard thing to accept and and with these days and, and you know what's going on now i i just can't even fathom and how is the weather over there the heat well i mean that's just one part of it i mean some some the, the heat you see you i was sleeping in a car i nearly okay I, I nearly froze to death many times froze to death uh, I was trapped out in the in the middle of a desert in Arizona, sleeping in my car, and I took a shortcut through the desert. I went off road, and my uh, Volkswagen bus, which was like a UPS truck, I mean, there was no cloth in it. There was no seats. There was only one seat for the driver. If you rode with me, you sat on a box, a shotgun, and the rest of it was just empty uh, metal. It was just totally stripped. I bought it for five bucks from a friend and a VW van. And I was sleeping in it. So that was my home. And I wanted to take a shortcut. So I went off road in a desert and I got stuck in the sand. So it's freezing in the desert at night. And I'm in San Francisco. It was a summer. But in the desert, there is no summer at night. It's It gets, you know, well, anyway, I, I was, so I had to, rustle up a cactus i had to walk you know in the dark i mean you know the stars there's no light there's no civilization i was in the middle of nowhere man and i had to you know pick up a, 
rotten cactus or wood or anything. I, you know, was walking all around carrying it back. And luckily I had paper and a match, you know. I guess that's one of the survival things that homeless people carry. Anyway, I started a fire and thank God the police came. They saw the fire and threw binoculars. And they came out and they wanted to arrest me for trespassing and burning a illegal cactus that you, there's, you can't pick cactus in the desert. That's illegal. You can get busted for that and find a lot of money, not, not small amounts. And they wanted to, and I'm homeless. And they're saying, well, you're, 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 you're burning. That's illegal. This is illegal cactus you're burning. And they're saying, I would freeze to death, man. Are you crazy? You know, and you're going to bust me for trying to stay alive? And so they let me go. They, they actually gave me a tow to, to a road because I was stuck. But, I mean, it was so serious that they let me go. They, they knew, they, uh, they understood that I was going to, I was in dire straits. So they, right. <clears throat> well, yeah. Larry, this has been such a pleasure. I enjoyed this conversation with you. And thank you so much for being on the show and sharing, you know, what you've accomplished, what you struggled. And I hope somebody today that's watching that, you know, has that challenge with dyslexia or ADHD, that this gives them a little hope. Wait a minute. I got to add something. Mm -hmm. This was just, I, for dyslexia, no, I volunteered to deal with my dyslexia the way I described. There are many actors real actors in Hollywood making big money, doing big parts that are dyslexic. They have other ways. I voluntarily did dyslexia my way, but don't think that you, this is the way to go with dyslexia. Oh, no. no. But if it resonates with somebody that's listening today, okay. that would you help you where I'm going. going. <laughs> yeah, you're not trapped by it. It's, it's a positive. It, it helps your art, man. It takes you to places you wouldn't think of if you were an ordinary person. So you have a gift. I just chose to use my gift the way I wanted to. But it's a gift. Don't, you know, remember that. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. No, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I just, if it helps somebody, especially that struggles with that, that wants, you know, that loves acting, you know, if it, just listening to you and watching you, if that helps them spark a little hope, to, you know, to work and figure out what works for them, then you're the inspiration. And I thank you for that. Oh, well, okay. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was a very enlightful, inspiring interview that I've had with and, and a performer that I've admired growing up and was able to watch. So stay tuned for another episode with Wake Up With Casey. You'll never know who I'm going to have on my show. Do you agree that, you know, it's time that we all wake up and take responsibility, even for our ancestors that did not know any better? been waiting patiently to have this kind of conversation. <laughs>